having me. Um, I also met June and I love her outfit, so that's possibly yeah. being highlighted today. Yeah. So uh, I thought uh, I would do this as, as useful as I thought uh, to you guys by just telling a few stories that I've learned uh, through my experience uh, growing my company uh, that I thought might be useful for you guys. So that's all I'm going to do, just share a few stories uh, that I thought might, might have some uh, lessons in them. So I'd like to start at the beginning, a very good place to start. I was born and raised in Argentina. Uh, and what brought me to this country yes. was uh, uh, that I, on a whim I decided to apply uh, to a couple of colleges that um, I had heard about uh, the East Coast, Harvard and MIT. And I started college over there because the, the calendar is offset. Uh, and once I had just started in March, I got acceptance letters from both, which was a huge surprise for me. And I had to decide what to do. So I visited hoping I wouldn't like it because I didn't really want to leave my family and my friends. Uh, and lo and behold, <clears throat> much to my chagrin, I loved it. Uh, it was just like in the movies. Uh, but I still decided that, um, you know, even though Good Will Hunting hadn't come out at that time yet, um, <laughs> I, I decided I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't ready to leave my home and, uh, and so I deferred for a year. Uh, and then a year later, I was having the time of my life in college in Argentina and so I just told them, no, I'm not coming at all. And a year later, I had exhausted the electives uh, at the University of Buenos Aires, and I was starting to actually got late, uh, was, was sleeping in late one night, one uh, morning, uh, not, not at my classes, and my mother uh, asked, hey, why are you not there? And it's like, oh, this class is really bad. And it's like, shouldn't you re be reconsidering that whole Harvard MIT business? And she left me thinking it was an Easter weekend, and by the end of the weekend, I wrote back to uh, Harvard and said, hey, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, transferring and Harvard wrote back right away saying, Ali, it's great to hear from you. Um, you know, the transfer deadline has just passed, so please write again next year. And MIT wrote back saying, Ali, it's great to hear from you. The transfer deadline has just passed. So hurry up! And that's how I ended up at uh, MIT. Uh, and, I, and I really built my company, uh, QS, kind of with that philosophy in mind. I hate it when I, you know, you show up at an airline counter and somebody at the other end says, yeah, you know, I totally agree with you, this is you know, ridiculous, but sorry, I have no power, you know, this is what the rules are. And, and I think places that have a healthy disregard for the rules, like MIT, are much better places to be. And, and so at QS, we empower every employee to make their own decisions for as long as they're showing good judgment uh, as opposed to the other way around. So, um, my uh, second story relates to why I'm here today. Um, and, and it's, uh, I, uh, I was at Caltech, I was a grad student, uh, and somebody asked for volunteers to go give a talk at the San Jose Tech Museum of Innovation up in uh, Silicon Valley. And I never say no to a free trip, and uh, so I, I signed up immediately. Um, and it was the least well-attended talk of my life. There was a, a boy in the audience, his dad, and two of my friends. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and that talk literally changed my life and launched me into entrepreneurship. Uh, because I, I used that trip to meet up with a, an old uh, colleague from Caltech who had gone into the Silicon Valley ecosystem. And, uh, and that, that led into me starting uh, my first company. So, uh, my experience has been, uh, it's very, very seldom to give a talk in front of an audience where there's not somebody out there who changes your life in some way. Uh, and so I can't wait to find out which of you is going to be today. <coughs> my, uh, my third story has to be, so a lot of people, I, I got a question from somebody while I was back there, like, where are you in terms of uh, funding with the company? And I, uh, my answer uh, was actually, well, we actually did this mostly without funding. So funding is not always the prerequisite. You know, you know customers can pay for things, actually. So about 10 million of our funding has come from customers. But, um, but I, I would like to share a story about funding. So um, early on in one of those trips to Silicon Valley, uh, I, uh, I went to present to a venture capital group, a pretty well-known group. And uh, so we, we, get, we get told, oh, there's going to be uh, an entrepreneur in residence at your presentation. You know, it's just the kind of guy who works in completely unrelated stuff, but we like to hear his thoughts. And so, okay, sounds great. And then we go into the room, and the guy was in there. And I guess he was in there before uh, the VCs walked in, and he hadn't gotten the party line about what he was supposed to say. So we introduced ourselves, and he introduced himself and saying, oh, yeah, I'm working on something very similar to what you're working on. <laughs> so, so we, we learned that these guys were not to be trusted and that they didn't say the truth. And so we just made a very quick uh, decision there and then uh, with my partners that we were going to walk out and not even present. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm very happy about that. So point is, just because the other people uh, on the other side of the table have the money doesn't mean that you, you know, you're out of mercy. It's your decision and you should never take money from anybody you want to leave your baby with because your company is your baby. Um, 
I think one of the biggest lessons I learned uh, is you, the people you have in the board of directors rules a company, and the people you have in the board of directors should be people that are not only extremely qualified uh, to give you advice, but also you would trust with your life. So don't forget that. Um, my fourth story uh, uh, concerns a day in November uh, in which I, uh, I took my family to, um, to a not story farm here in Southern California, and I did one thing for most of the day. You guys can probably guess what that was. Um, stand in line. Exactly, stand in line. That's what you do most of the day at any theme park uh, in the world. And uh, by the umpteenth time that I was standing in line, and this was only just for, uh, for food at noon, I told myself I had to be a better way uh, than standing behind other people's butts to figure out in what order people get served. Uh, and the line was just long enough that I uh, kind of came up with the idea for QS by the time I reached the front of the line. And that's how Kilos was born, so we, we filed patents uh, shortly uh, thereafter. In fact, uh, one of the people who helped us there, Brian, is right there in the back. Um, and started the company uh, within uh, a few short months after that. Um, so I think one of the things that has fueled um, Kilos' success is our passion, my passion, and those of uh, every other liberator in our team, because uh, that's what we call ourselves, the liberators, um, for freeing people from standing in line. Uh, for we really believe we really want to use this product. We hate standing in line. We hate waiting, uh, and so we are we're doing something that we want to use ourselves, and that makes it so much easier uh, than uh, to create something that, that works. But my fifth story: um, people always assume that uh, assume that everything has already been done that can be done right, and so you typically have, uh, you know, well, if it doesn't involve the technology that has just come out, then it's probably already been done. Well, people have been standing in line for 3,000 years. We have examples of literature, literally of ancient Egypt, people standing in line for barbers and, and for food. Uh, it's, it's documented in literature. And the technology that we use is uh, a really fancy thing that just came out called the cell phone. It's been around for a few decades, right? And yet, nobody had done what we've created um, before uh, we did it. And so, uh, don't assume that things have already been done. I, I, I remember uh, one time coming up with this um, idea for how you can actually uh, beat traffic by having uh, the information about the speed of traffic at each point coming from each person's uh, cell phone. Uh, and I was up in Silicon Valley, and everybody in Silicon Valley knows better, and so when somebody immediately told me, oh, that's already built into uh, Google and Android. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I won't go that. And uh, you know, a few years later, Google paid a billion dollars to buy ways to build exactly that. So don't trust people uh, when they tell you it's already been done. <coughs> so the, the the sixth story is really not a story, uh, but more of a more of a calendar. BC day. Uh, okay. I think I'm supposed to be here now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you made it. Uh, let's see. Disconnect and reconnect. There we go. Okay, so um, starting a company is a fair amount of work, um, and so you might as well do it for something that you believe in, something that's worthwhile. Um, I think there's, there's two parts to that. One is something that you care about. In my case, again, I hate waiting in line, and so uh, finding a company to eliminate waiting in line from the face of the earth was something that I cared deeply about. Uh, but secondly, if you're going to start, spend your life uh, doing something, you might as well solve a big problem, right? In, in, in this case, the average American spends two years of her life waiting in line, and the, uh, the U.S. Uh, economy loses at 1.2 trillion dollars from the productivity loss of people uh, waiting in line. So, if you pick a problem, try to pick a, one as big as you, uh, as you can find. So, this, what I'm going to say next, it goes uh, counter to everything I think you usually uh, hear. I've, my whole life I've heard focus, 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 and there are times to focus, absolutely. Um, but you don't want to focus until you know what you ought to be focusing on. Uh, and so when we started QLS, everybody's first idea when you tell them, hey, I've got this technology of limited waiting in line, they think back, well, when did I just think of waiting in line? Oh, it was yesterday when I went to dinner or when I went to lunch. So we said, oh, restaurants are the natural place. And that's what we did. Our second, third customers were, um, were restaurants. It turns out that restaurants are not really tech savvy. They have low profit margins. They go out of business every second year. 
um, so um, they're not always very professionally run. Uh, you know, they're often built by people who are amazing cooks who you know became very successful. But particularly the ones with long lines, they're just people who cook really, really well. It doesn't necessarily mean they know how to run a business very well. Um, and so uh, we learned through trial and tribulation that there were lots of other industries and verticals that I mean we have plenty of very happy restaurants don't get me wrong, but we learned that there were plenty of other industries that needed our solution even more. Um, and were much easier to work with. Uh, and I think if we had made a master plan at the beginning and said, this is the industry we're gonna focus on and restricted ourselves to that, we would never have stumbled upon uh, how colleges, for example, we have plenty of colleges from NYU to UC Berkeley to the LA Community College District and Fullerton College uh, that use QLS for registration, financial aid, advisement, counseling, all kinds of things that I would never have guessed because Caltech doesn't have a line because they have too much money and too few students. Um, <laughs> So uh, open yourself up to the world and let demand from the world tell you where your solution can be used because we've learned incredible places that I mean, Dow Chemical uses Keyless tool for lines of contractors for safe inspections. Who would have learned that there were lines at a factory? Uh, we have the Port of Antwerp in Belgium uh, has eliminated international, literally uh, congestions of trucks across across international border lines that were so big. People were getting killed because the trucks are, are congested and they're up here, they can't see uh, people down here. Uh, and if they were going at 20% lower capacity than they could because truckers couldn't even get to the cranes at the back of the port because of the congestion. The congestions have completely gone since they used this. You know, we would not have thought of ports when we started. So, um, so yeah, open yourself up to, uh, to diversity before you decide what to focus on. Number eight, again, goes, I think, against the count of what you'll hear, right? So the typical San Francisco startup focuses in an area between the Golden Gate Bridge and the Bay Bridge. And, that's their focus area of the group, right? <laughs> and that's okay, except that most of the world doesn't live there. You can see, you know, lots of the highly popular areas in the world are elsewhere. In our case, um, we were a small little company with no employees in a garage um, until we one day got a seven-figure deal with uh, Vodafone in Spain. And that allowed us to hire our first employee and start going from there. And that would never happen if we had said, no, sorry, we only serve people in the US, we only serve people in English, right? Um, so open yourself up to the world. Um, the ninth, ninth story concerns the government. So I, I think it's common wisdom to say, oh, startups can't deal with government, government is slow, and you know that's for big companies to deal with. You can let Boeing and Northrop Grumman deal with the government. Um, well, we have found that to not to be true. Uh, I think I counted yesterday, six out of our 10 largest customers are government. Uh, two others are state-funded uh, education institutions. Um, so we have had great success with government and our average sales cycle for the government has been only four months, which is not uh, that long. It's only about a month longer than the private sectors. Um, so we have never ever lost a government customer in all of our years in business. So, Obviously, you have to have a solution that works for that, but it, it can be an extremely stable um, set, set, set of customers. So don't shy away from the government. And uh, on, on that note about customer uh, government, I, I want to tell you a story. Uh, so one day we, uh, we went to a trade show uh, for DMVs, and uh, our salesperson there learned that uh, the state of Texas, the Department of Public Safety in Texas, had just released uh, an RFP looking to get a specific solution that they wanted to eliminate lines there with tickets, and monitors, and it had already been written for somebody else. Uh, it had been released, it was due in I think five days. So it's the kind of thing that you might say, well, that's too late for that. But he came back home and we quickly put together a response to that. Um, in fact, we, we had so little time that by the time it was finished printing, the, uh, the, the cutoff deadline for FedEx to make it in time was gone. And so I had to make a, a, a decision with a very little funds that we were actually gonna send the salesperson to fly over to Texas to hand deliver it because it was the only <laughs> way to make it in time. And uh, lo and behold, we won the contract and the Texas Department of Public Safety now has saved millions of people hundreds of years uh, because of that. So it's, ne it's never too late. Um, and that, that story about Texas also had a, a lesson about size. So at the time that we won the contract with Texas, um, the biggest DMV we had made, uh, we had uh, served, was the state of Kansas. And Texas did not miss any opportunity to let us know that uh, the entire state of Kansas uh, population fit in the suburb of Dallas. 
and they had these discussions that are, are public. Uh, they, they were very worried, the commissioners there were very worried about the proposed contract with California company Culis. First of all, it was a California company. Uh, but uh, the company has been incorporated for only three years and has just 35 employees. We didn't have even close to 35 employees. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this seems like a really small company to think of something of this magnitude, said the commissioner. I'm very, very nervous. Uh, I'm, I want to go on record saying that I'm very concerned with respect to a company this size tackling the magnitude of our queuing situation. Um, and, well, at the time of this, uh, the Texas DPS was on the news almost uh, every week there because of the long queues. And when, when they launched QLS, they were on the news only criticizing them for why they hadn't put all of their tech, uh, centers to be QLS already. Um, they, they increased their customer satisfaction by 113% in the first year. They increased the number of people who went to the p places that had Aculus by 50%, and no-show rates went down by 35% while uh, whilst that happened. So, yeah. um, so you're never too small even for Texas. Nor too small, um, and so this is a different story. Uh, so we, we applied to the American Business Awards, the uh, uh, Gold TVs, and uh, we were named the best computer services company, uh, no, best business services company in America that had under 100 employees at a time when we had no employees. No, no, the whole story here is not about the war, it's about the fact that we had zero employees. Uh, and so this is, this is what uh, our place looked like at the time. Uh, the garage didn't even have windows. Uh, they just saw the windows were under construction. Um, I think another thing that has been key at, uh, at critical junctures is to really believe in the company. Uh, I mean, any parent will uh, tell you that they would gladly, you know, put the, the baby before themselves, right? They would sacrifice and for it. And I think an entrepreneur uh, needs to feel that way about the company too. Uh, and, you know, I can't tell you how many times, I mean, I, I went without a salary um, for eight years. That's a little extreme maybe, but, um, you know, I wanted every dollar to be in the business uh, growing the company. Um, and, you know, there were times where we didn't know we were, if we were gonna make payroll and I was the first one to cut myself off, right? And that's, Behind that, we have never ever laid off, uh, laid anybody off. So, um, so yeah, you, you you really want to put the company first. Um, so the fourteenth uh, story is is actually a story of one of our uh, most difficult times. Um, so we there was a time uh, when we we lost a critical member uh, of our team, and we went through really difficult times because that person had, we had zero redundancy for this role. Um, and, um, and so I think that the, the lesson is always have redundancy. It's very hard when you have a small team to have duplicates of anything, but you really want to make an effort, right? So you want to make an effort for information, knowledge to be distributed across the organization. So there's always a backup for anybody else. Uh, if you look at the best uh, managers, you look at any great CTO, VP of engineering, you'll see that the organization has multiple layers. It's not a flat organization of everybody reporting to one person. There are people who can stand up and become the leader if the leader has some, you know, goes away or something happens to them. Uh, so remember to uh, build redundancy. Um, and uh, on, on that note, I'm going to teach you a little trick, uh, in case some of you may not know it, uh, that I found really handy during that time. So. We work with a number of recruiters, and we've got a lot of resumes, but we, we are really picky at hiring. We, we found that uh, we, we are uh, many times more selective than Harvard is in, in hiring engineers in terms of how many resumes we go through before we hire somebody. Uh, and so it, it took us a while to find the person we were looking for to uh, replace this one person, and uh, it turns out that big data hands the answer to this one. Um, much more than any individual recruiter out there. So if you go to uh, LinkedIn and look at, and, and you have a model for the kind of person you're trying to get, and then you just look at that person's profile. In this case, I just I just took my, my profile there. Uh, and there's this little part at the bottom right that says people similar to that person. Well, that is an amazing, it, the big data that, used, that LinkedIn uses to compile that is very powerful. Uh, and the people there, that's exactly how we found our, our, our next VP of engineering is I talked to one of those people. I, I actually didn't hire somebody directly there, but we got a referral from somebody who was right in that list of a few people there uh, for an amazing person that we hired and uh, got lucky to attract to a team. Um, so interestingly enough, I discovered that uh, one of the few people most similar to uh, me in the world happens to be the founder of, uh, of Shozilla uh, guy over there, so interesting. So my uh, 16th story, and we're getting close to the end here, um, has to do with persistence. So 
I, uh, my team knows that I never give up. I just never give up. And um, um, in one case, uh, this is actually a story right here in LA, West LA College, um, over on the west side. Multiculous and decided to just go with a, a cheaper solution where you just pull up a ticket and, and wait it to be called. Um, yeah, this maybe tells me, I, I actually haven't told you how Oculus works, so maybe I'll spend a minute saying that, right? So, what Oculus does is it lets anybody join a mobile queue from any mobile device, roam freely while they wait, get updated as their turn approaches so they can show up just in time for service. Okay, we get 100% adoption at 100% of our locations because we are completely on your channel, so we work with that. Uh, we, we, we not only have Android and iPhone apps, but we also uh, work through text messaging, which is the most popular app known to humankind. We work through voice calls, we work through web browsers, we let people pull a ticket if they don't uh, have a phone that day. Um, so that's what we do. Um, and West Lake always said, you know what, no, we're, we're just uh, going to go with the solution. There was no way to talk to them uh, out of that. So they launched that, and um, you know, we, we never gave up. And a few months later, they came back to us and said, you know what, that thing doesn't work. We want to this. And so if you go to uh, West LA College today, you'll see this uh, kiosk from the competition uh, that has a little sticker they put on top of it with our logo. Uh, so, and, and we've had that happen. Uh, so the, the Nevada DMV is a great example where um, we lost uh, an RFP that was written. So I actually showed up uh, at this beautiful place in Big Sky, Montana for a trade show of the DMV organization as well. And I took my kids, because it was in Montana, I took two of my kids, and I sent them to go get people to come to our booth, um, which at the time, it was just me manning the booth. And so one of them brought the director of the Nevada DMV. So says, come over here. And uh, so I talked to him, and he loved the solution. So we put on an RFP uh, to get Qlist. But the, uh, the RFP was run by a series of uh, government employees who didn't really understand the difference between uh, different uh, solutions out there, and so they heard from somebody uh, that makes these legacy systems where you just pull up a ticket, and they said, oh, we can do what Qlist does, and so they, they won that RFP, and within a few short months, Nevada had come back to us and said, yes, they say that they haven't been able to get anybody out of line, uh, and they came back and put out a new RFP, and they got Qlist, so it, it's never it's never too late, I mean, we had that happen a, a, a third time uh, with uh, an, another uh, state DMV that uh, chose a, a a cheap solution that doesn't work, and they came back to us and said, hey, we're trying to get back with you guys. Um, so never, never ever give up. Um, so build technology that uh, even non-techers want to use. I, this is a really interesting story that actually happened uh, also in West LA College on the West Side. We went there to show we had some people coming from Asia that wanted to uh, see how Oculus works if they can over to Asia. Um, and so we went and visited West LA College, and I was wearing a Qless um, shirt, and the student approached us and said, oh, thank you, thank you for building this. I know it lets me, I take so many different uh, courses at, uh, at once, and I have two different jobs, and uh, you know, and, and this really allows me to, I, I wouldn't be able to do this if I had to wait, waste the time that I used to have to waste, you know, waiting in line for it. Now I'm able to wait in multiple lines concurrently, show up just in time. Uh, and you know, it's really easy to use. Usually I find technology hard to use. And I kind of just got curious about her, and I asked her, well, why, why do you usually find technology difficult to use? And she got a little closer, and she said, well, I was in jail for the last 28 years in prison. And so this was somebody who had gone to prison before the first cell phones had come out. And came out and saw a whole different world. If you had could ever hire a test user and say, well, I'd like to hire a visitor from the past, somebody who has no exposure to the technology in the last 28 years, and let's see how they, if they are able to use it. Yeah. And when that person came and told us, I mean, say, yeah, I find this really easy to use, that was a huge testament to us, you know, that we had created something that even somebody who had seen no technology for 20 years could use. Um, so um, build, you know, hire prisoners for your user groups. <laughs> On, on that note, um, I, uh, I shared with uh, part of my team, we went out to dinner uh, last night, and I shared with part of the team that I was going to be giving this talk, and I asked them, hey, any stories you'd like me to share? And, and uh, Amar and our team, um, you know, Amar is worth a, a chapter in and of uh, himself. So we, we recently got told um, 
that we had uh, won the uh, award for the best computer services company in the world at the International Business Awards, and that that's what's going to be awarded in uh, Rome later this month. Uh, and so I said, well, let's let's figure out through a vote who's going to go from QLIS to receive this. Uh, you know, it's no reason for me to go myself there. And so we submitted nominations for what we call sainthood, since it was in Rome, and said, hey, uh, whoever gets voted as the person who's made the biggest miracle for QLIS uh, recently uh, gets to go there. And uh, Amar is a, a support engineer uh, who, together with uh, Anna, another support engineer of ours, had gone way outside their job to create, invent a brand new hardware solution that solved the problems that our customers had with the existing hardware. It made it easier for support. Uh, you know, it, it had better economics. Everything about it was better. Uh, and they had done that completely on their own without anybody asking for anything. And that's one of the key things we look for in people we hire is people who have that entrepreneurship to do something that nobody asks them to do. Uh, we tell people at QLIS, we have a, a QLIS code, and one of the values there is it's everybody's responsibility to improve everything we do. There are no sacred cows, there's no turfs. Uh, you have to, if you find an opportunity, you have to go and improve it. Uh, and that's what these guys did. And so, Within a few months of having been hired, this uh, guy who's a support engineer on the front lines got uh, selected to go represent the whole company and go to a flight of Rome to receive a, this award. And so that's Amar, and he shared the story uh, that he called um, a story about patience. Uh, but I, uh, I wanted to highlight the fact that you can do anything remotely because that's, that's so tightly ingrained with what a SaaS company is all about. So he was um, serving a, a a customer, I think in Missouri, that runs the DMV. Missouri's, uh, the DMVs in Missouri are run uh, privately by private corporations. There. And uh, this one is called Dogs on Duty. So, you know, <laughs> go figure. That's a DMV. And they um, they were trying to set QS up, so they had to set up a kiosk and a monitor using the same computer because they didn't want to buy two computers. Uh, and, and so uh, Amar was trying to help them install that. And so he said, well, um, you know, grab the grab the mouse, and he got stopped right there and says, hold on, hold on, hold on. Which one is the mouse? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yet he was able, through patience and determination, to guide to, in through the entire installation of this without, uh, you know, without having to go there. Um, and we've seen this. We have a burgeoning set of customers uh, throughout Australia uh, without any of us ever setting foot in Australia before that. So. Uh, or even during that. Um, so, so that's the beauty of SaaS and web-based, is you can do all these things around the world without ever having to sit put there. So I'd like to end with my uh, last story and lesson, and that's, um, so I got this advice from somebody um, once, it's just, who just didn't believe in what we were doing, you know, it, it was a particular, uh, particularly rough time we're going through where we were having some technical issues and, uh, and so the advice was, just go out of business. There's really no, there's nothing you can do. It's, it's too late. Just go out of business. Um, and uh, luckily, I, I, I didn't listen. We didn't listen. Um, and so the, um, the result is now um, our customers include Walmart, Kaiser, AAA, Berkeley, Dow Chemical, NYU, Vodafone, the Department of Public Safety in Texas, and DMV in Nevada, and the DMV in Kansas, and New Jersey, and Michigan. We have 99.7% annual location retention. We have 137% annual revenue retention. 4.5 out of 5 children in both app stores, uh, which is uh, considerably what Spotify has. Uh, and so I think our, our customers see this uh, getting out of line as music to their ears. Uh, we're in 34 states, 16 countries, 5 continents. Uh, we've been growing exponentially since the very beginning uh, with a, almost a, almost all of us bootstrapped. Uh, we have over 70 million users now that we say from standing online. Since we launched our apps uh, earlier this year, uh, the app usage has been growing at over 2,000% a year. Uh, and we just, uh, most of all, um, went towards our mission of eliminating a waiting line by saving people almost 2,000 years of, of waiting. Uh, we've been named the best computer services company in America for the last four consecutive years, and the uh, best one in the world for the last two. Um, and so I, I want to finish with a poem that my mom gave me when I was a, a small boy and I, I've had in my wall for years. Uh, it's called Don't Quit. And it says, when things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns as every one of us sometimes learns, and many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. So don't give up though the pace seems slow, 
you might succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup, and he learns too late when the knight slipped down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt, and you never can tell how close you are, and maybe near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worse that you mustn't quit. That was really impressive. Thank you so much for. Uh, it was a really impressive um, story. I mean, I, he he touched upon a lot of stuff at the very end, um, and and it was really impressive. But you know, one of the things I really picked up was mostly bootstrapped. That is really hard to do, especially with all the success that you've experienced. So we really appreciate your success in sharing that story and the toolkit information to help us with our own individual businesses and aspirations as we as we help uh, ourselves and our teams grow. So that's really awesome. Another round of applause. That is really two thousand years. That's awesome. Okay, so we're going to open up to Q and A now. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. Please save your comments for offline. Will, will you be hanging out with us a little bit after the okay? As the Q and A is over. Very good. John will walk around with the mic. Raise your hand. Oh, get your question answered. Thanks. I actually have that pump closer on my uh, on my desk as well. So good to see that. I'm the only one that knows about it. Great presentation. Thanks. Uh, question about your pricing strategies and philosophies. You have lots of different customers using different types of services. How do you charge different customers? No, we have different pricing strategies for different verticals um, because of, there's there's different constraints. So, for example, we learned that in particular markets, budget and predictabilities are very important, and so they want very fixed, uh, predictable pricing. Um, and other places where you know, volumes really matter and allow us to price at the right level for each uh, for each kind of customer, uh, just different different customers, different needs. So it's quite it's quite a versatile uh, pricing uh, based on different verticals. Okay. Um, as a SaaS product, I was just wondering how much impulse there is to customize for each of the solutions for your for your various clients, and how you if you have that struggle, how you deal with it. Yeah, that is a constant struggle. So that's a great question. Um, it it changes with growth, right? So at the very beginning, if you have um, one customer that's providing most of your revenues, then you're going to be very very uh, uh, inclined to uh, to what they need. Um, and then as you grow and, and customer concentration goes down and you have no customer, then you can be more and more sticking to your roadmap, uh, strategic roadmap. So we, we have a split in it. There's, there's no magic formula. It's a, it's a constant balancing act uh, between, either we have people who represent the customer, and, and so they're always pushing for the latest thing the customer wants. Uh, but then there's a strategic roadmap that no customer is asking about because they don't know about it, but it could have a huge strategic impact. So it's, it's a balancing act. Over here, um, you are, you mentioned you were a, a SaaS company, and yet throughout your talk you talked about plane tickets and, and hardware. So how how did you how do you incorporate hardware into a software company? Okay, I'm glad you asked because I, I maybe I wasn't clear. So the, the, the ticketing part is the obsolete solutions we replace. It's it's not uh, really what we normally do. Although we do allow people without cell phones to pull up a ticket too. So you're right that. Uh, Customers can request hardware from us. We don't. We don't require any hardware. We're, we're hardware agnostic. It doesn't need any hardware. Um, but uh, but we do provide hardware to uh, places of money, and we need to include that. So um, in that case, we just we just um, resell the hardware, uh, and uh, as you know, as as an initial uh, sort of startup um, expense to the customer, that way we're a complete solution. So we find that customers want to get the complete solution, so they don't want to have to deal with somebody else. Uh, for that, and so we just you know include that. So it's off-the-shelf hardware from another vendor. Uh, yes, to a large degree, we're hardware agnostic, so we let customers choose their own hardware. Uh, so that's that's pretty much true. Uh, well, we've, we've done some innovation since, so it's it's getting to be where we we add more value there now too. But uh, initially, it was something like that. Yes. Okay. Do you have any plans to bring this technology to Nashberry Farm? 
and tell us, hey, you didn't find any. <laughs> That's a great question. Okay, I, I hope I hope all the theme park executives of uh, California are here in the audience. Um, <laughs> Well, that, that's what I built it for, right? So we would uh, love to bring it there. Um, so we have found that theme park executives are um, traditionally not the most innovative and forward thinking of a uh, bunch out there. We have found that government is a lot more innovative. <laughs> we have found that theme park executives are really worried about getting rid of the lines because they see lines as a storage device for crowds and people. And they are afraid of what might happen if you release the dams and let these people lose around the park. And some of them don't seem to have noticed that they have all these places where people can go play games and spend money and yeah. eat and yeah. drink. And that even a person who finds nothing else to do would be happier just yeah. walking around than being forced to stand yeah. in line yeah. and advance one little step at a time. It, it, it amazes me how slow the theme park industry has been adopting this. Um, Part of it is, is, is also they're, they're just, they're so afraid around IP and so, you know, I mean, you, you talk to a company like, like Disney and, you know, they talk to us and they get it and then they're like, you know, was it built inside here? So uh, it's, um, yes, I am absolutely looking forward to that day and I am confident it will come because there are a few places that get as much benefit from a thing like Oculus as a theme park where not only are you making people so much happier because what they do most of the day is waiting in line, but in addition to that, you're freeing these people to go out and spend money throughout the park. Uh, and you're getting people to come. I mean, the number one reason I don't go with you know, three kids more often to a theme park is because of the waiting in line. I would be there so much more often. So this would be an, an amazing, and, and we do have, we do have some, uh, some small parks using it. Uh, so it's proven that it works, um, but uh, it's, you know, some, some industries just take a little longer than others. Uh, so, what what line problems exist in the world? Oop, over here, in the back. What line problems exist in the world that you're not participating in that you want to be participating in? Well, there are temples in India where people wait for a really long time to uh, go adore, uh, and uh, we have yet to be uh, called by uh, the relevant gods to uh, certainly. <laughs> Lots. I mean, we, we keep adding verticals, um, and so I'm sure there are uh, many that we haven't thought of, and, and several others that we've seen. Uh, but vets, for example, how many times have you had your uh, pet pop fight with another pet while you're waiting in a, in, in a veterinarian, right? Uh, so imagine if you were just free to take a walk around and just got to call us as you turn around. Um, all right, so that's, that's one. Uh, any place with, I mean, doctor's offices. Um, I haven't talked about this today, but um, Waiting in line was just the first paradigm we've made obsolete. Um, a second one is appointments. And there's a great episode by Larry David on this. If you do a search on uh, YouTube for Larry David appointments, you'll, you'll see it. Uh, and you know, it's, how many times have you been to a doctor with an appointment and not had to wait? Yeah. How many, right? How many, uh, lift your hand if you had to wait even though you had an appointment. <laughs> yes, appointments are an obsolete paradigm. Why? So. The doctor does, it's not that doctors are stupid or evil. They don't know who's gonna come in with a common cold, who's gonna come in with cancer. They don't know uh, who's gonna <clears throat> show up late or not show up at all. They don't know which doctors or nurses are gonna show up the day or who's gonna show up sick uh, or not show up. And with all that uncertainty, it's impossible to keep a schedule that was planned weeks in advance. So appointments are a solution from a time where it was impossible to communicate with people in real time. But that's no longer the case. So we've invented something called Keyless Flex Appointments that update, self-update in real time in both directions. So if your doctor's running late, it lets you know, don't show up at 3, show up at 3.20. If you get stuck in traffic, you can push yourself back and it'll automatically replace you with patient who thought they weren't gonna be seen that day because there wasn't enough availability, but saw all of a sudden something got open, right? It's a complete game changer. People are loving it and, you know, that's, a, that's an area where there's a lot, I mean, you know, most doctors are still not using that today. Uh, so there are lots of areas, every place, um, I mean, I'll give you more examples. You send something to the IRS when we when we needed to prove, forget for what kind of paper we needed to prove that we were a U.S. corporation and we needed some paperwork from the IRS. And you send this in and you wait for months to find out, you know, to get their response back. You don't know whether they received it or didn't receive it, where it is. If the IRS was using QLS to uh, line up paperwork as opposed to people, um, then you would know exactly. You're 137 in line. It'll take us three weeks to get to you, and you know we expect to get to get it there. Um, lawyers and, and courtrooms, right? I mean, jury duty. You have people waiting all day for jury duty to find out that they don't need to show up. With QS, they could be going about their life and showing up just in time. 
lawyers, they charge you $500 an hour to wait in, in the waiting courtroom room to see when they're gonna be called. It's ridiculous, the amount of waste. Waiting in line costs the state of California alone billions of dollars every year. Okay, so if any of you is a friend of Jerry Brown, I'd like to meet with him next week. <laughs> <laughs>